Last time, we built a small board around a linear voltage regulator and tested it with our LoRa project. We didn't see much in the way of power savings, but we were able to get a nice steady voltage out of it. Now, let's turn our attention back to trying to lower that current draw. If you remember back from the battery episode, we talked about needing to average around 100 microamps in order to get our project to last for a year on two AAA batteries. Right now, we're averaging about 4.7 milliamps, so we still have some work to do. We likely won't be able to decrease the current consumption during the transmitting phase as the RFM95 radio uses most of that. That means we need to turn our attention to the idle phase, especially considering the 328P, RFM95, and BME280 spend most of their time doing nothing. For this episode, let's talk about sleeping that RFM95 and BME280. We'll leave sleeping the microcontroller for the next episode. First up, the RFM95. If we look through the datasheet, we'll find the power consumption chart, which gives us an idea of how much current we can expect the module to draw in its different states. I believe that the module sits in standby mode when it's not doing anything. If your device is plugged in, one or two milliamps isn't much, but when you're running off batteries, that can add up over time. We need to figure out how to put the RFM95 into sleep mode if we want to go from 1.6 milliamps to less than one microamp when we're not transmitting. Scroll down to find the operating mode functionality chart. This shows us that we need to use the reg op mode register to set the RFM95 to sleep mode. Let's take a moment to review registers. A register is just a piece of memory used for storing data. In some systems, registers are different than random access memory, or RAM. But in something like our ATmega 328P, registers and RAM coexist in the same piece of memory. The first 32 bytes of data memory in our 328P are a collection of registers that we do not have access to, at least when we write in C or C++. The processor uses these as a place to store data whenever it's performing calculations. The next set of registers, known as I.O. or extended I.O. registers, are special function registers. This is the magic of microcontrollers. By writing specific values to specific bits in these special function registers, we can control the actual hardware, like toggle a pin from 0 volts to 5 volts. For the AVR architecture, the rest of the data memory is reserved for static random access memory, which is where we can store our data, like integers and strings. Note that SRAM is cleared on reset and all the registers return to their default states. Many modern sensors and modules are very similar to microcontrollers. In fact, many of them have small microcontrollers in them. The point is that you often need to look at a set of registers in the modules in order to control its functionality manually. Go back to the RFM95's datasheet and look at the table of contents for something like a register map. It looks like section 6.1 has what we need. So scroll down to 6.1 and we find a list of all the special function registers and their addresses in memory. So by writing data to these particular memory addresses in the RFM95, we can control its features. Cool. Earlier, we said that we needed the reg op mode register, which looks like it's a very important register that controls some of the main functions on this module. Scroll down to 6.4 to find more details about the registers. It looks like we can write 000 to bits 0 to 2 to get the RFM95 to go to sleep. I hope it's this easy. Just to be sure, let's see if the Radiohead library has a sleep function already made for us. In the Radiohead code, bring up the .h file for the RFM95. Run a search for sleep, and we see that they've defined sleep mode for the reg op mode register. Keep going, and we see that they've at least declared a sleep function for us. Let's open up the corresponding .cpp file and search for that sleep function. From what I can tell here, all they're doing is writing out that 000 binary code over SPY to the reg op mode register, and then storing the mode inside what looks like a field variable. I'm not sure how we wake from sleep mode. Hmm, if we take a look at the send function, we can see that set mode idle is called, which should, in theory, wake up the RFM95 from sleeping before transmitting. Open up our weather client code and scroll down to the loop section. If I read the library correctly, all I should need to do is put an RFM.sleep call right after I send out the data. 
the dot send command will wake the RFM95 up from its sleep, so we don't need to worry about waking it up manually. Before we see if this actually works, we need to get a baseline current draw from the RFM95 while it idles. So let's comment out this line for now before we upload it to our 328P. To start, I've added the linear regulator that we made last time. I'll use my power supply to give it 2 to 3 volts to emulate a couple of AAA batteries. I'll program the 328P using my USB to serial converter. Notice that I removed the power line from it. We don't need to power the project from this board anymore since we added a regulator. However, I've noticed that some voltage can be detected on the power rails with just TX, RX, and DTR plugged in. So, to get an accurate measurement, we'll need to disconnect the USB to serial board each time after we're programming. To measure the RFM95's current draw, I've replaced its ground connection with a 1 ohm resistor. We'll use our oscilloscope to measure the voltage drop across this resistor. When we capture a transmission burst, we can see that the RFM95 is using close to 80 milliamps. On standby, it uses about 1.5 milliamps. Alright, so let's uncomment our sleep line and re-upload it to the 328P to see what happens. Transmitting is still close to 80 milliamps, but when we try to look at the sleep current, it looks like a pixelated mess. We're hitting the limits of the Analog Discovery 2's resolution, so we can't get a good reading of very low currents. If you try to use a larger resistor, you might start introducing too much of a voltage drop to power your device. If you've got some extra money to spend, some good multimeters and DC power supplies will give you measurements down to the microamps. This can save you time and headaches, but it's also very expensive. They're also limited to showing you average DC current, so you might miss some transient spikes or dips. If we can't afford a new benchtop tool, then there is another route we can take. Math. If we can amplify the voltage across that shunt resistor, we can get a much better reading. The only thing is we have to do a little bit of math to calculate the actual current draw. Specifically, we're looking for a current sense amplifier, which is more or less a pre-configured op amp. With some searching, we find that the TI INA21X series looks to be pretty good. As they say, go big or go home. So let's go with the INA212, which gives us the biggest amplification of 1000. For each volt drop seen across the shunt resistor, it will give us 1000 volts at the output. Don't worry, we won't hurt anything as the amplifier will max out at the supply rail voltage. If we give it a 5 volt supply, it won't be able to give us any more than 5 volts at the output. Take a look at the charts and notice that we lose gain if we start to oscillate the current. After about 2 kHz, we lose a good bit of accuracy in our measurements, so these amplifiers are really only good at DC or low frequency current sensing. Keep scrolling to find the section about selecting the shunt resistor. Here we see that we ideally want 10 millivolts or more across the shunt resistor. Let's take a look at the typical application circuit. While the RFM95 is sleeping, we're expecting about 1 microamp to flow through our shunt resistor to the RFM95. With a 10 ohm resistor, we won't get the full 10 millivolts drop that the datasheet asks for, but it'll have to be good enough for now. During transmit, we saw that the RFM95 would consume about 80 milliamps. 80 milliamps across a 10 ohm resistor gives us a 0.8 volt drop, so we're going to need to provide at least 2.6 volts to the RFM95 to keep it from dipping below 1.8 volts during transmit. That means losing the linear regulator for the time being. The INA212 output will also give us a garbage reading during transmit, as we'll max out the amplifier. So we'll just focus on the idle or sleep current for now. One microamp flowing across the 10 ohm resistor gives us a 10 microvolt drop. The op amp measures that difference and outputs a voltage 1000 times that amount. So 10 microvolts times 1000 is 10 millivolts, which we can definitely measure with our scope. Also. Note that we want to connect the ref pin to ground, and the datasheet recommends a 0.1 microfarad bypass capacitor at the supply pin to help smooth out any noise. The INA212 only comes in surface mount package, so you know what that means. Yep, we'll need to make a quick breakout board. I'll mill it on my Bantam Tools milling machine and solder the INA212 to it. I'll add the 0.1 microfarad capacitor from the supply pin to ground and put a 1% 10 ohm resistor across the input pins. First, notice that I removed the linear regulator. 
We're going to use the full 3.3 volts from the USB to serial adapter as I'm worried that the 10 ohm resistor will cause the RFM95 to drop out if we're at 1.9 volts. I've replaced the 1 ohm shunt resistor with a wire to ground on the RFM95. The INA212 is a differential sensor, so we can use it on the high side, meaning we can break the power line to measure the current. So we'll put 3.3 volts to the in pin and then another wire from in minus to the RFM95's power pin. We'll power the amplifier with our power supply set to 5 volts and then we'll use our oscilloscope to probe the difference between the INA212's ground and out pin. When we give the project 3.3 volts, you can see the system start up and then begin to transmit every 3 seconds. Notice that the transmit cycles are listed at 5 volts. We're saturating the amplifier, so this is a useless reading. When we zoom in on the idle periods, we see that it's reading about 30 millivolts. 0.03 volts divided by 1000 gives us 30 microvolts, and 30 microvolts divided by 10 ohms gives us 3 microamps flowing through the resistor. This doesn't quite line up with the 0.2 microamps predicted by the datasheet, but this is likely error induced by the amplifier since we don't have a full 10 millivolts across the shunt resistor. However, it's much better than 1 milliamp, so we can safely assume the RFM95 is sleeping. Let's do the same thing for the BME280. In the datasheet, look for sleep mode, and we see it's in section 3.3. This section tells us that in normal mode, measurements are taken all the time, regardless of what we tell the sensor to do. So, it looks like we need to set sleep mode and then use forced mode to take a measurement, as it should go back to sleep after each measurement. To set these modes, we need to see section 5.4. It looks like we can set bits 0 and 1 to 0, 0 in the control measurement register to enable sleep mode. Back up in section 3.5, the datasheet gives us a number of recommended settings. Weather monitoring is close to what we want to do, so it recommends using forced mode, just like we found setting all the readings to times one oversampling and turning off the IIR filter. Once again, let's see if the library already abstracted this register writing for us. Looking through the Adafruit BME280 header file, we can see that sleep mode is defined. In the methods, we can manually call set sampling to set the mode to sleep, which looks like it's set to normal by default. We can also use it to set the oversampling and filter modes to match what we found in the datasheet. Then we can use the take forced measurement method to force a reading. To measure current, I'll put the current sense circuit on the BME280 side. I'll connect a 3.3 volt power line to the in plus side of the amplifier and then connect another line from in minus to the BME280's power supply pin. Notice that I reconnected the RFM95's power pin back to 3.3 volts. Before we add sleep mode code to our program, let's take a look at the BME280's current draw. Whoa, it looks like the BME280 is constantly drawing current, even if we only use the readings once every 3 seconds. It only sleeps very briefly between readings. From the datasheet, we know that it first measures temperature, where it draws around 340 microamps according to our measurements. Then it measures pressure, which maxes out our amplifier so we can't read it. Finally, it measures humidity, consuming about 327 microamps. Back in our code, we add a set sampling call in setup. We use the predefined configuration settings to set the mode to forced, all of the sampling to times one, and turn off the filter. We can leave the standby duration, the last parameter in this function call, to its default, since it won't matter with forced mode. Then, at the beginning of our loop, we tell the BME280 to take a forced reading, which will wake it up, take measurements, and go back to sleep. We can leave the read data section as is, as that's what we'll need to get the actual measurements from the sensor over SPY. Let's upload this to our 328P. The first time I did this, I found that the BME280 was pulling a few hundred microamps while idling, which certainly didn't match up with what I found in the data sheet. After some digging, I found the reason. The SparkFun BME280 breakout board has a couple of 4.7 kilo ohm resistors attached to the shared I2C and SPY lines. This is great for I2C, but we are using SPY. With SPY, the SDI, or MOSI line, should be high impedance when not in use, so that's fine. However, it seems like the SCK line idles low when not in use, which means you're then sinking some current through this pull-up resistor. Thankfully, SparkFun gave us some jumpers that we can cut to disconnect these pull-ups. 
Using an X-Acto knife, I'll carefully cut the jumper traces on the back of the board, which should disconnect the pull-up resistors. When we measure the current again, we see that the forced readings are saturating our amplifier, but the sleep mode is definitely working. We zoom in and see that the current draw has been reduced to about 3 microamps according to our measurements. Once again, this might be an error, as we're not giving the shunt resistor a full 10 millivolts. But it does prove that sleep mode is working. I wouldn't count on these single microamp measurements to be completely accurate, but it does show that we've gotten the two external components to go to sleep, which is great. The important thing now is to test the whole system current draw. With the 328P and LDO still pulling some current in idle, we'll need to adjust the gain on our amplifier. Let's switch out the 10 ohm resistor with a 1 ohm resistor and we'll put it in line with the power supply before the LDO. Remember to reconnect the BME280 power. We're reading about 542 millivolts from the amplifier, which when divided by 1000 for the gain and divided again by 1 ohm, we find that the system now pulls about 542 microamps at idle. Just to check these measurements, I've hooked the system up to my multimeter. 0.55 milliamps is darn close to 542 microamps, so I'll call it good enough. After adding the linear regulator, we found that we were pulling an average of 4.7 milliamps. By sleeping the RFM95 and BME280, we lowered the idle current to 542 microamps. For now, we'll assume that the transmit current stays the same, as we did not measure that. This gives us an average of 1.8 milliamps, a whole 2.9 milliamps lower than last time. We're definitely getting closer to our goal of 100 microamps. We have one more component to put to sleep, and that's our microcontroller, which we'll cover on the next episode. Please subscribe if you want to keep up with this series and see more like it.